Throughout my film viewings, I've found many different actors and actresses that I adore, and Romy Schneider has recently become one of them. After seeing her a few months ago in a well-crafted 50s remake of Machen in Uniform, I was well and truly captivated, quickly going on Amazon to order as many films of hers as I could. Now, Romy had an incredibly varied filmography, ranging from comedies, kaleidoscopic experimental cinema, political dramas, Kafka surrealism, and almost existentialist romance. Despite her relatively lower profile outside of France and Germany compared to other European actors, even to this day people are captivated by her and new footage is released of her works. But I noticed something. There are some films of hers I wouldn't really have chosen to watch if she wasn't in them. For me, many of them are very much products of their time. So then I asked myself, why? How did she appeal to her viewers? What made her so exceptional many reviews and more lackluster films say that they're still worth watching just for her? So after doing several readings on performance, I decided to write an essay answering these questions. I will examine movements and nuances in her acting style, but above all, break down my observations as to what made her such a captivating on-screen presence. I started off with this song because I feel that moment is just one of the most prime examples of the tenderness she was able to bring to such a simple scene. This film, Group Portrait of a Lady, tends to be considered as one of the more criticised ones I mentioned earlier, but I wouldn't have guessed from this clip alone. By this point in her career, she was playing relatively grounded and realistic characters. This was a serious portrayal of Nazi era Germany, for example. It was heavy material as her first outing to German cinema again after leaving it for a decade, and it could certainly be argued she challenged herself with this role because of both personal circumstance and culture at the time. Post-war Europe involved a number of movements in reaction to that generation, and this silence surrounding what happened, and this film was no exception to that discussion, but I won't speculate on her connection beyond that. A similar example can be seen in Death Watch, one of her final films. It was concerned with the callousness of modern media and how they handle death, a kind of precursor to Black Mirror in my opinion. In real life, Romy was continually hounded by the press, extremely callously in some cases, and this was a sort of response to it. She played Catherine, the dying woman victim to the press, with sensitivity, as well as a strong underlying defiance. When Bertrand Tavernier asked her to take the role, she accepted but replied, I will be your Catherine without self-pity. Frequently, Romy stated that she always wanted to work, that she would become bored easily and end up in inertia. Thus, in her work, she wanted to take on the guises of women different from herself and see a variety of different perspectives. And so this is a part of what she brought to the screen. She had a connection to many of the characters she chose, and this drive to play different women meant an investment into her roles for a number of reasons, both cultural and personal, from the get-go. <laughs> One of the first examples I can see of Romy playing a more realistic character is Manuela in Machen in Uniform, the beginning of her transition into more controversial roles. Manuela has a very jarring vulnerability about her, always seemingly lost in her own thoughts, and this evokes a sympathy from the first scene she turns round. Lass dich ansehen. Sie ist schrecklich schüchtern und sonderbar empfindlich. Ihre Erziehung ließ bisher leider manche zu wünschen übrig. Romy played this up by tending to look away from others, often up into the air, as though Manuela is always thinking and comprehending these new surroundings, or just entirely disengaged out of grief or sadness. Manuela was also quite a shy character, and Romy's body language portrayed this as she was quite inwardly focused, with her hands tending to be nervously in front of her apron, grasping at it. To clarify, I don't think it's great theory to microanalyse small movements because they're usually subconscious, but sometimes it's interesting to shine a light on just a few to get a sense of an actor's rhythm and appreciate their interpretation as a whole. In this scene, for example, she tilts her head up despite remaining still, trying to point her posture towards Berenberg, but knowingly restraining it because Manuela can't express herself fully in the role of Romeo quite yet. And when Berenberg emphasises to her that Romeo is in love, she quickly clenches her hand, like she's caught by that word. Again, I'm not saying they're conscious, but it is these small movements that give the scene the right sense of momentum for what happens next. I believe that thanks to its more serious tone, Romy inhabited the role with much more maturity than she had her once previous. She was allowed to play a character of more depth and examine their struggle more explicitly. In turn, this allowed her to begin to experiment with layers in her characters, something which I feel was missing from Cece. Of course, due to genre constraints. Now later on, a lot of these details didn't come completely subconsciously. Romy would be meticulous to say the least. 
Bertrand Tavernier, the director of Death Watch, gave the best description of this, which I find pretty incredible. Here he describes how at the start of shooting she asked to do another take. I said if we were doing a new take, then we would be doing overtime. She replied, I will pay. She called the producer and said, Gabriel, I am paying for the hour. I want a new take. I learned many things with Romy. When she was asking for a new take, she was always right. Always. She was changing a detail. The second thing I learned with her was that I was cutting too quickly. When I had everything I asked for, I was seeing cut. With Romy, I waited 10-15 seconds more because suddenly she was giving a smile, a way of looking at somebody. At the end of every moment, she was adding a touch, which was most of the time very poignant. In Boccaccio 70, she plays a drastically different kind of role under the watch of Licino Visconti. Pope, the rich wife of an aristocrat in the segment Il Lavoro. She is the classic careless rich girl and the film always highlights this. She is constantly moving, either talking, gazing at herself in the mirror, smirking, dressing into and undressing from these luxurious designer outfits and only twice ever having any kind of still reflective moment, the central one being at the very end. To me, she carries a lavoro because again there is a rhythm in her movement, there is a beat to her expressions as she has conversations. Romy plays out her every thought almost instantly to the point there's never a dull delivery of her lines. Pope's movements are open, every single conversation is a variety of facial expressions. Her eyes widen, she changes her voice tone almost theatrically, her movements are short and fast reflecting her spontaneous modes of thought and she expresses with her arms and hands openly. There is a playfulness, but it is noticeably different to her previous more lighthearted roles. It's underlined by melancholy, the results of which can be seen in her still moments where the camera has a close-up of her with tight framing, so the audience isn't in to focus on when she has a moment of sad realisation or reflection. So Pope wants to work, she wants to maintain their marriage and their agreement of sorts and in the end it's revealed that she planned to make her husband pay for sex just as he caused a scandal by going to visit a brothel. The final shot is a long take with a slow zoom as Pope finally sits motionless, the realisation setting in while her husband waves her new cheque in front of her. It's the reality of the situation closing in, hitting her. So the very final few seconds are interesting. There is a hesitant smile that creeps upon her. It's nervous, unsure, almost echoing that constant movement from earlier. The smile is superficial. She knows she has to perform for him, but the grief that she feels at having gotten to this point, the constraints in her life and how they've affected her is just overwhelming. And so what we see is Romy balance these two intense emotions at the same time, showing how deeply her character is affected by this internal conflict. While Romy didn't start out in theatre, it became an important part of her as Lucino Visconti cast her in a small controversial theatre production before production of Boccaccio 70 in order to push her talent further for transition into the more serious roles, and that influence can be seen here. Thus, her role in Boccaccio 70 to me at least was defined by movement, and eventually the lack of it. Romy used her different influences in acting to shape the character through expression, a skill she would take advantage of frequently in her filmography. Battle on the Island is notable to me because it showed what she was able to do with a more unsure script. It was an explicitly political film directed by Alain Cavalier at the start of his career and the general French New Wave movement, but the story was not as up to scratch as its aesthetics. It's certainly a piece more based on mood, so it is kind of noticeable that Romy doesn't have as much concrete depth to sink her teeth into as she does with some of her other roles. However, as mentioned, she is still able to stand out. She plays Anna in a very endearing way. She's innocent and playful. This vibrance gives the character notable quirks in the face of her abusive husband exerting total control over her life. She's very much a victim and a torn figure for the audience to sympathise with, but this isn't delved into beyond the surface. Her carefree and innocent nature is her character's position in the plot of sorts because she's supposed to be an apolitical figure, an unchanging personality that I'm guessing was intended to make her a centre point for the love triangle between the two men who represented the political left and right. And Romy understood that sadly her character was more of a focal point for the other two. Whether characterization wise this was the correct approach is debatable to say the least, but Romy decided to keep her character consistent. While the film didn't pick its battles well amidst the complex human interest and metaphorical politics, she did. She was able to stand out because she knew how to make the most out of it by drawing out the character's emotion, something I'll delve into later. She never downplayed Anne's feelings or vulnerability in the many situations or get mixed up in the characters as metaphors stuff too much. 
I feel like this balance she could strike up between innocence and tragedy comes from her roots in the Heimat film genre, a post-war German film movement full of predictable morality, saccharine characters, usually royalty from myth, and pleasant German scenery. There wasn't usually any realistic grit to it, but it was born from a kind of idealism that the people there wanted due to the brutality of the war. After the famous Sisi trilogy, she became sick of always having to play saccharine characters, despite having great skill for it, but she took advantage of that skill, and used it to give more than one dimension to her characters when appropriate, fleshing out their vulnerability with emotional engagement. This can also be seen in films like Jean Chapeau's La Voleuse and Carl Foreman's The Victors. She had an affinity for understanding characters and mood, but she also had skill in understanding the films she was making and what they required of her. Throughout Les Combat, you have this strange dissonance between the level of her acting and the lacklustre script, but I think it's a strong example of what she could do despite such setbacks. In stark contrast, when Romy got her hands in a script that was truly suited to her, with all the depth and complexity of a character she could dive into, that was where she shone brightest. A director she worked with frequently, Claude Sauté, once described her as being as sublime as an allegro of Mozart. She could not stand mediocrity or any decaying emotion because she had so much feeling. Romy made many such films where the emotions that she imbued in her characters were incredible. She's so known for this she's described as a virtuoso of emotional chords. And so I decided for this segment to use the film that is arguably the crown jewel of her career. That most important thing, love. Apparently, even Romy said it was her best work, and it won her the first Cesar Award for Best Actress in 1976, and it is inarguable that she deserved it. Jacques Dutronc, her co-star, said in an interview that when her character Nadine cried, Romy was really crying, that she was living it, that the film never stopped after the take ended. Now, this is pretty debatable, given Romy said anyone who thought that she was her character was an idiot. But she also said that for Nadine, it was just enough to appeal to her memories. So, this film to me, thanks to her own words, was the most explicit in terms of her having a deep emotional connection to the role, and everything down to the direction and cinematography served to emphasise every performance. The characters inhabit the world with a whole host of emotions bubbling under the surface, and Romy's performance in particular reflected that with great nuance. There's a seriousness, and distance from any kind of true affection, or emotion that isn't fraught with worry or angst. What contrasts with previous roles is that these negative emotions are not uncontrolled as a result of shock or current events. They're fixed in her, and have developed as a part of Nadine because of what she has been through. The camera indulges in that, becomes a participant of this horrid voyeurism Nadine is always subjected to. As a character, she's depressed and, in my opinion, very possibly traumatised. But at the same time, she's a whole character. She's not always a tragic caricature. She can laugh and tries to have principles. She's trying to understand love in a world that distorts it. Où est le bar et je vous sers à boire tout de suite. Pourquoi Vous n'êtes pas bien Oui, je suis très bien. Écoutez, je n'ai pas beaucoup de temps et c'est pas pour ça qu'on est ici. While there is a connection between the two protagonists here, it's difficult for either of them to deal with. While Cervez is being rather obvious and shallow, Nadine uses a great deal of restraint, and Romy delivers every line with a careful distance. She's curious, but overall defensive. Romy accentuates her voice when Nadine catches him out, or asks him questions, as though Nadine is reading him. As well as this, she doesn't break eye contact, and that shows that genuine curiosity and feeling for him. Much of the scene was contemplation for both characters. They're trying to understand each other despite their myriad of setbacks, but it is those setbacks that cause errors in the way they communicate. Both lack empathy to some degree, and it is shown by their lack of reaction and indifference to the dramatic dialogue. And throughout Le Important, she places a great tension in her muscles, as though Nadine is forcibly pushing down her frustrations and anxiety, and at each point when she finally lets go of her emotions, one can see the tension relieved, albeit usually with a weary, upset face. There are several times in the film where she cracks, and in many of them you can see through her movement a subtle build-up of tension, until she can simply no longer restrain her anger or upset. And this scene where she meets her husband Jacques in a cafe is by far one of the most important to her character. J'ai tellement envie de toi, j'ai tellement besoin de toi. Y'a personne, personne au monde que j'aime plus que toi, personne. Alors, tu sais, il faut pas me laisser seule. Il faut pas. Je peux pas rester seule. Tu où Tu où Où Ici Où Je sais pas où tu es. 
Je peux te donner beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup encore, tout. Mais je ne veux pas que... Je ne veux pas sentir que la vie, c'est ailleurs. Je peux pas. Je vais tout faire pour toi. Tout. Tout sauf. Sauf quoi Vivre. Je peux te dire que je t'aime. It's just one of the most standout scenes along with the ending. Here comes her turning point. She's had many outbursts before, but now so volatile as this, because Romy understood Jack's words were straight to the point of what had bothered her character for so long. You can see she moves her hands, covering her face, her eyes, and that movement again is building up and showing that sheer stress Nadine feels as she tries to push that upset down until she no longer can. The director, Andrzej Żuławski, said, I chose Romy Schneider not only because of her talent, but because of the affinity between the actress and the figure she was to embody. Because between her and the person she played, there was always a deep agreement. His words reminded me of one Jacques Dutronc and the director of Mädchen in Uniform, Arthur Browner, made previously. And thus I suspect a part of her acting method was to blur the lines between reality and screen a little. But because of her own words, I don't really agree with the very pervasive notion that she totally became her characters. I'd also hesitate to categorise this as method acting in itself, because I'm not sure necessarily if this was her intention. Rather, I revisit my previous statement. She placed a heavy emotional investment in her best roles in order to inhabit them fully. This investment paid off and gave the characters deep emotional depth, but she would always go one step further with an affinity for this great intensity. Perhaps gained from life experience, yes, but always tempered and honed by her hard work and the knowledge of acting she built over her career. Despite the numerous setbacks she experienced, she was incredibly dedicated to acting as a profession and approached many films through friends and connections, so she never limited herself to a particular genre, really. Looking at it broadly, her filmography actually plays out like a story. Her style develops over time and you can see how the work she did in her past informed the ones that she did later, allowing her to evolve and always become more refined in her skill. From the start, she always strove to improve and never let herself be satisfied with where she was. She was driven by this desire to explore her potential. Romy inhabited her roles of understanding and care, and imbued them with feeling, with life, many times to the point it transcended weaker scripts and direction, and she could always go a step further, bringing something more than realistic emotion. She was able to bring an unparalleled vibrancy to her roles, which could range from melancholy to joy and still keep all the layers in between because she was a master of balancing both nuance and intensity and feeling. Regardless of the type of role and what it would require, she made the role hers by many times just channeling a great deal of energy into them, including details in her performances that even directors would notice and change their takes for. She knew what kind of momentum each scene required and how to carry that off, and had a great knowledge of cinema as a medium, as well as different kinds of acting across the board. All of these qualities were alongside her natural affinity for the screen, and when it was truly brought to the forefront with solid direction, cinematography and writing, she created performances that are many times astounding. As an actress, she'll be remembered for her intensity, her magnetism, and a filmography that evolved drastically. She was able to shift into any role she played and gave life to each one with a vivid and beautiful authenticity. As Tavernier said, in terms of emotion, she was wise, she was generous. She gave and she gave, and the audience felt that. 